right, everyone, welcome to Stoa. Hope everyone's having a, a lovely Sunday. And today is the first session of a four part series called The Practice Problem. And this is serving as a build up to the third iteration of the Beyond Self Discipline course that is starting on September 3rd. Uh, this series is going to serve as a way for people to get a sense of the history and theory. Uh, behind uh, BSD, but more importantly, to get a taste of the practice or meta practice, uh, because BSD um, is a practice with practicing with practices. Um, and it will be an interactive series, uh, and there will be something for that you'll be practicing week to week uh, if you choose to do so. Um, and we're labeling uh, BSD. Uh, as an experiment in practical philosophy, and Daniel will go into more in depth with uh, about what practical philosophy means. But uh, it's something that this guy, uh, Pierre Hadot, uh, kind of really started in, um, in, in the philo uh, academic philosophy, uh, philosophy as a way of life. Uh, and he argued that modern philosophers are artists of reason, uh, interested in, in, in theory, but the, the ancients, like the Stoics, uh, were artists of life, uh, practical philosophers. And um, he has a, a book about Marcus Aurelius in your citadel. Uh, part of the practical philosophy kind of scene is reading about the you know, primary text of the Stoics. And one we're geeking out about right now is uh, Peter Sloterdijk, uh, um, You Must Change Your Life. Uh, so I present this because there's uh, theory behind a lot of the stuff that we're doing, but we're not going to talk much about the theory. We're going to just talk about uh, the minimal viable theory because we're uh, practical philosophy is about practice. So that being said, uh, what we're going to do today, uh, we're going to have a presentation uh, for you, uh, and then we're going to move into a more interactive portion uh, near the end. And we'll probably be here for uh, 60 minutes, maybe less, maybe more. Uh, we'll see. Um, but that being said, while I fire up the slide. Daniel, is there anything that you would like to set as initial framing? Yeah, I think I just want to highlight something you mentioned, which is we want to focus on practice and this idea of what is the minimum viable theory so that we actually get practicing is a really important theme in this whole BSD project. So I'm going to uh, share my screen and Daniel is going to uh, jump into the presentation. All right, so I'm going to start off by level setting on what beyond self-discipline is. And some of you are familiar with this. Some of you have probably read the post of the STOA. Some of you have been with us before, and some of you are joining us in the coming cohort. Um, and we're going to start with just talking about it at a high level. And then Peter is going to get into some of the deeper problems that BSD is attempting to address. And that's going to be the bulk of the presentation. But to start, what is BSD? We're kind of triangulating something here, and there are a few different definitions that have been floating around, and these are three to get us started. The first is you can think of this as a boot camp for your best self, and bespoke meaning um, it's going to be catered to the individual because not everybody needs the same thing. Another way to think about it is it's a course about practice and this idea that Rubeki brought um, called the ecology of practices. Like, how do you get all your practices to align together? In a, in a harmonized ecology. And then this third definition, which I really like, it's an experiment in practical philosophy. And uh, I'll explain what practical philosophy means. Um, there's two major visions of philosophy. If you look at the history of philosophy, there's this uh, primary division, which I think a lot of people have the intuition for, where on one end, you have theoretical philosophers. So this is the Contemporary philosophers, when people think about philosophers in academia, you think about these guys, right? The analytical philosophers that um, are artists of reason and they traffic in, in arguments and problems and propositions and they write like treaties and they create like intellectual architecture. And then there's this other tradition, which are practical philosophers, which are artists of life. And these are people that traffic in spiritual practices, things that are geared for self-transformation. And a huge influence of us, for us uh, that Peter mentioned is Pierre Hadot, who articulated this dichotomy really clearly. And he argues that 
if you think of uh, philosophers of antiquity, if you think of the Greeks, they were actually practical philosophers. Like uh, they, they, were, uh, they were embodied people. They were strong. They pursued excellence in all areas of life. They weren't nerds. And so this is one way to think about it. And I, I really like this quote here, which basically sums it up and sums up the intellectual history here. Um, oh, yeah. So the most basic divide in the history of philosophy is theory or speculation oriented towards truth. So truth being that central value versus vital practice oriented towards the good. So everything that we've been exploring and everything that Peter's going to talk about next is in this latter branch. And so I'd also like to share our personal history because I think some of you know this story, but I think this is where you start to realize that this is a not just like a fun intellectual exercise for us. This is quite real. And I really love this idea that the personal is universal. So I'm going to walk you through our story here. Um, depending on how you scope this, this is like a 10 year to 30 year journey. Um, and some of the highlights are in 2013, before I ever met him, Peter was running these mastermind meetings in Toronto. So these are traditional accountability groups where a few guys would get together and they take their word really seriously. They'd say, okay, you know what? I want to get in shape. Um, I'm going to go to the gym seven days a week. And then they commit to each other. And then that group accountability would get them to practice what they believed was good for them. In 2015, I needed some help. So I went to see Jordan Peterson and he was my therapist and I was having issues with uh, motivation, you know, and I was like, I was worried that I was depressed and I'm actually going to write a post about this in some detail. And I, I told him that in my life, if I look at my life and I look at the times where I felt like I was actually performing the things that mattered to me, if I felt that I was, I was actually in integrity and my days were good by my, my own definition. All those times had to do with some form of accountability. And I had been running my own accountability groups to help me with that. And so Peterson, in his wisdom, in my second session with him said, you know, I've never done this before, but there's somebody else that I think you should meet. And if you're okay with it, I'll introduce you to him, another client of mine. And this was Peter. And this is the legendary email, um, you know, very, very to the point, where in 2015, Peterson introduced us. And then we, we brought together our experience with this accountability thing and then started running these mastermind groups together. Um, in 2017, this uh, secret club emerged. And if you want to know a little bit more about this, um, there's a post uh, that's linked over there. It's uh, one of Peter's journal entries. And this was where we took some of these ideas and put them in a context of almost like a, a debate fight club where you again, there's this theme of like beliefs and practice, right? You take your words and you take them very seriously. And then you'd, you'd hone them in, in, uh, in an environment where everyone's oriented towards speaking the truth and then having their words ma match their actions. And that was like a huge part of um, this history. And then 2020, COVID happened. Peter creates the STOA. And then one of, uh, one of the early series was uh, the Metagame Mastermind, which some of you I see some familiar faces some of you have been to. And this is where we took some of these practices and we, we shared them with people because we realized that one of the things that really sucked about COVID was people were isolated. So how much better would it be if you had a group of people that could support you in, in your practice? And uh, if you're curious about the metagame mastermind, it's kind of morphed into something that I'm exploring um, on my Substack, which is the metagame.substack.com. So a lot of those principles that we explored there, I'm now like in a more like open-ended uh, exploratory phase with. So all of these things came together in the very first version of BSD in October, 2021, where we started prototyping this. And then in May, 2022, we did a more formal version uh, where we officially launched it. And then in September, we're taking it to the next level. So that's, um, that's coming up, that's next month. And so, what is the actual experience going to be like? It's a two-week thing. It's a two-week course where you design and live your heaven week. And this is a play on the Navy SEAL idea of hell week, where they have this really intense boot camp and they make it as hellish as possible to, to basically like weed out people. And so what if we turned that around and we made the week not about being as hellish as possible, but being as good as possible, being as glorious as possible by your own definition. And so you had to 
do hard things. You know, you have to be disciplined, but it was oriented towards the good. And the structure that we've worked with is week one in, in the, with the help of the collective and with the help of inquiry, we design that week for each person. And then week two, we live it out with the help of mutual support, with the help of accountability and friendships of virtue. So if you want to sign up, um, the next cohort begins on September 3rd, and it goes till September 17th. So it's two weeks. And we're giving a generous discount to STOA patrons. We're giving 50% off. The ticket price for the course is just under $1,000. And part of the reason for this is it requires skin in the game. It requires commitment, and it's not for everybody. And so if someone's willing to invest, then they will get more out of the experience. There's only so much people can do without participation and investment from others. But we really want this to be accessible to people that are committed and that want it and, and are a good fit for it. So that's why we're giving 50% off for STOA patrons. But if you still can't afford that, just message us. If you still have financial troubles and want an additional discount, then we can take that case by case. Um, and I'm going to share a link, two links in the chat right now. The first is the course page where you can find out more about it. And the second is a Calendly link where you can book a 15 minute call with me just to talk about it further. And that's BSD. Awesome. Thank you, Daniel. I got like super excited uh, hearing the, the, the timeline of this. Um, and uh, so part of this, this series, this four part series that we're offering for everyone uh, at the STOA is, um, as I mentioned before, to get people excited about it, get a sense of it, and to actually uh, practice um, together. Uh, but it's also an excuse for Daniel and I to flesh out the, the theory of BSD, because there's this is an experiment. So there's two things going on, the, the designing the practice and experimenting with that and iterating through each cohort, and then and thinking about the theory. Um, so we're hoping that at the SOA, you know, what a better place to do it uh, than here. And there was something like uh, that felt missing in the other two cohorts, like something that uh, BSD is responding to. And so Daniel and I co uh, cohered around this, this notion of the practice problem. So the BSD is, is here to respond to the practice problem. And I'll explain what, the, what this is. So, but first, what is practice? Um, Wikidiff uh, distinguishes a uh, habit and practice, like, you know, uh, maybe you're, you're familiar with um, what a habit is, and they define a habit as a, an action done on a regular basis, while practice is, is something also done on a regular basis, but is to improve a specific uh, skill. Uh, for the purpose of uh, this course in BSD, we're taking uh, like a like a more meta perspective on what practice is. And we're just going to define it simply as a recurring action that shapes one's capacity. And we, with this higher kind of uh, um, order definition, it houses uh, habit as well. And so we created this two by two. Uh, and one axis is a deliberate being sort of conscious of what you're doing and intentional. Uh, and then uh, automatic, something that's just, you know, perhaps it's a little bit unconscious. You can just do it uh, without thinking. And then the other axis is, is something that's foolish to do and something that is wise to do. So uh, in the bottom right, we have the bad habits, you know, it's, it's, it's foolish and automatic. And then uh, the bottom uh, right, good habits. Uh, and I'll give some examples in a moment. And then the, the, the top uh, foolish, foolish practices and wise practice. Because uh, you can be intentionally doing something that might be foolish to do uh, or could be wise to do. And we kind of see these as a spectrum. So here's some uh, examples. Uh, yeah, for bad habits, the what I like the, uh, to call the, the unholy uh, trio of uh, the man child, uh, porn, weed, video games. But, uh, you know, there's uh, many other bad habits that you can, uh, you can imagine you, you have or you know people who have uh, good habits, the wiser automatic, brushing your teeth, making your bed, cleaning your dishes. Uh, and then the ones at the top, I give the, the probably many examples of foolish habits, but I kind of like the, the three bypassing, their spiritual bypassing, psychotherapeutic bypassing, self-help bypassing. And the kind of the through line between each is that you orient towards doing something in that domain, uh, spiritual, psychotherapeutic, or self-help. And you really should be doing, it's like an overcompensation. You should be doing something perhaps um, more simple. Uh, so spiritual bypassing, 
let's say uh, you're confused about life, instead of jumping into some intense week-long meditation retreat, maybe you just need to uh, journal or you know uh, talk to a friend of virtue, get some advice. Um, and if there's some maybe some this nebulous emotional issue that you're you're, you're having. Maybe it's not wise to do this intense shadow work retreat where you're like, you know, investigating your trauma. Maybe you just need to work out, you know, like for, for uh, 30 minutes in the morning to get to kind of get some energy um, and then self-help by, by, bypassing. Like they have all these like goals, like, you know, like read a hundred books, self-help books to improve your life. Like maybe you just need to like listen to a couple of podcasts on the, on the topic uh, to get the, the gist of it and not read all, all that. So even those are those intentional, they're improving some skill, they perhaps they could be foolish. Uh, and then this, what is wise uh, practices? I put a question mark here, because all those things that, that I mentioned, uh, um, you know, could be wise in, in some context. Um, it depends on the person and where you're at. Like, of course, the ones that come to mind are things like meditation, breath work, journaling. Uh, but I like smoking a cigar uh, once a week and then philosophizing with myself. That might be a bad habit for some people, but it feels like it, it nourishes me a lot. Um, so this is something that uh, should be bespoke and meets the person uh, where they're at. And the idea here, and if you're familiar with John Verveke's work, uh, he talks about ecologies of practices or ecology of practices. And we have an ecology of practices that fall in each one of these quadrants. And the idea is to become conscious of it and move towards uh, these two. So practice problem, now we got a sense of what practice is uh, and the way we're, we're defining it in the course. What is the practice problem? We purposely um, are avoiding kind of defining it directly. Daniel and I uh, did our uh, take uh, on our sub stacks and I'm asking a bunch of people in this space uh, in, in the Stoa, uh, uh, the wider Stoa family to do their own definition. But if you want to take a crack of defining what the practice problem is, there's a lot of smart people in this room right now, uh, please do so. But we see uh, at least six or four or five, I should say, aspects of what the practice problem entails. Uh, practicing things you do not want to do is one. So these are the bad habits. Um, practicing things that are actually foolish to do. So I gave a few examples before, like you could be practicing something that is actually not uh, good for you. Um, not practicing things that you know you should do. So, uh, you know, the, the big three is like, uh, conscious sleep, um, working out, fitness, and, and, and eating eating right. Um, that's escapes a lot of people doing those three. Uh, not knowing what to practice, this is a huge one. Uh, and we're going to be having guests throughout the course, and hopefully we're, we're going to bring uh, Nathan Vanderpool, who's doing a survey of all the wisdom practices out there. Um, so it's good to get a download of um, what to practice. And the still has been doing this in a very kind of a, you know, wild way, but there's a lot of people doing good work who are gonna invite on to the STOA who are having a curriculum uh, on wisdom. Uh, but yeah, it's this understand like, well, what do I practice? Like there's so much different traditions out there. Uh, there's so much different states we can cultivate. Uh, what's the wisest uh, ecology of practice to, to uh, engender? And then the last one uh, is key, uh, not having your ecology of practice and or ecologies of practice, and they're, they're slightly different, but we don't have to go into that, uh, not being in harmony. Um, so it's like you can have an ecology of practice and they're not uh, coordinating with one another. You know, they're, they're, they're frustrating. You can't get it to stick. Um, and we call this the practice soup. So I really like this term practice soup. And it got inspired from um, Dave Chapman, who does the meaningness uh, blog. And this is from uh, his blog post that you can kind of see right here. So I'm going to read this to you. Since the mainstream culture broke down, it is no longer considered important where ideas came from. Everyone says and thinks things like, you have to honor your feelings. All religions point to the same truth. And you have to make your own authentic choices and fight off the mindless messages you get from society. Everyone has their own truth because everyone has their own perspective. Be in the now. Almost no one in the West had ideas like these 100 years ago. Almost no one now realizes that they come from, respectively, psychotherapeutic uh, theory, Hinduism, existentialism, postmodernism, and Buddhism. Almost no one recognizes that if you take such ideas seriously, they are seriously incompatible. Uh, <laughs> so it's like, you know, we hear all these things like, oh, that's cool. It makes me feel good in the moment. And you kind of adopt it in your, uh, you know, your ecology of thoughts, uh, but they're not coherent uh, with one another. And this leads to uh, the thought soup. 
or, or what Andrew, uh, it's Daniel and I mutual, Andrew Tager, Daniel and I mutual mentor, he calls it the great muddle. People are just confused. Um, and a thought soup leads to a practice soup. Uh, and this is really the practice problem. Like people really don't know what to practice in their college or practice. So they're just like, oh, like just taking anything, right? Like, oh, breath work. And everyone's talking about breath work. Let's just do some Wim Hof breath breathing. Uh, like, you know, there's a yoga class open up. Let's do some yoga. You know, I heard it's good for me. Uh, let's do some meditating. I, I don't know where it's uh, going to lead, but let's do it. Uh, I want to look good naked. So let's just hit the gym. Uh, all the cool kids at the, the store are doing some journaling. So let's do some journaling. Um, and, you know, these are like, each one of these are great and they have their place. But if they're not in right relationship with, with each other and you're not doing it for the, a wise reason, uh, then they could be out of place. They could uh, be a practice suit. Um, and this is why uh, practical philosophy, if, uh, if you listen to anyone like John Verveke, Pierre Hado, or our mentor Andrew, uh, one of the key practices there is inquiry, whether uh, engaging in inquiry with yourself uh, via journal or with another um, via, you know, dialogos, which John Verveke calls via, uh, dialogos, because inquiry helps uh, give coherency in the, the thought soup, which in turn, um, gives coherency with the practice soup. Uh, and so you have, it's kind of like the glue uh, we see with all the other practices. So um, what is this? Yeah, so I'll pause there and Daniel will have an exercise for us. Yeah, so one step, you know, one rep of inquiry is to just ask what's in your practice soup? You know, what sort of ingredients are you are you cooking with? Um, and so I'm, I'm gonna prompt you guys if you can just write whatever the answer to this is in the chat so we can get, get a sense of what people are dealing with. One way to think about it is what are different practices, routines, or habits that you do, like you currently do, um, you've tried to do unsuccessfully, or you think you should do. There's like some ideal future state where, you know, I'm meditating every day or whatever it is. Just uh, informally write, write them down in the chat and let's see what everyone's dealing with. Everything everyone's written so far, I, I really do. Reading, reading's a big one. People feel like they don't read enough. Walking slowly, I like that one. Yeah, for me, really big ones that they've always just been there um, and I've never really got them to stick, but I just feel like I should do them uh, have been uh, breath work and visualization. Like I always hear people say visualization really helps like keep them focused, but I've just like never been able to get that one to stick and uh, breath work. I, I don't know why I like resist that so much. Um, before I hand it back to Peter, just one thing like looking at this, you get the sense that there's a lot that you could be doing. And all these things sound really good. Like on the surface of them, they sound like if anyone did them, they would be good for them. But there's, there's a trade-off. There's only so many hours in the day. You only have so much willpower. You only have so much vitality to install these new practices. And uh, having this like the lack of clarity about which ones are the most wise for you right now makes that whole process really, really hard.
And one thing I'll add, like uh, what excites us about this whole process is uh, not just gaining the wisdom of and discernment of what practices to choose, um, finding a way to be disciplined towards them is another uh, aspect, knowing what's out there. But a lot of it comes down to just like the basics of like scheduling uh, and being flexible and having a system. Um, and so the whole BSD uh, two week experience, we'll, we'll get into all that. But now let us, let's solve this problem. Let's, let's solve this practice problem. Um, so how do you make your practice soup tasty? This is the question that we're gonna be asking. Uh, there's three options that, that we see. Uh, maybe there's more, uh, put them in the chat if you, if you know of any. But option one is living in uh, what Goffman calls a total institution. Uh, total institutions are things that, uh, places that you live that kind of cuts you off from the world. So like military barracks or monasteries. Um, and so we uh, uh, recommend like live in a total institution uh, with wisdom as a superordinate value. Uh, and uh, Monastic Academy, from what I see, is, is one of the um, best, uh, and they have, uh, the, I think it's the only one that has really a transperspectival um, kind of perspective, even though they have a Buddhistic uh, um, origin. And the challenge of, uh, with uh, relying on the total institution approach, though, is you have your EOP, your ecology of practice, designed for you, really. Um, it's given to you. So you don't get the kind of the skill set to have a system to design yourself and that you're in a culture of accountability that expects you to do it. So it's like, there's kind of like that, the social field there uh, serves as a great forcing function. And not everyone has the opportunity uh, or need really to be in a total institution. And there's other kind of failure modes with that we can get into. But uh, so option two is what we're doing, just join this uh, experimental course in practical philosophy uh, and engage in a bespoke boot camp with your EOP. Um, so it's sort of like a, a, like a decentralized digital monastery, if you will, um, with no central authority. Um, and the idea there is to create a psychotechnology, a system that can just spread, that you can do it with anyone. That's option two. And if you're interested, again, you can sign up for the, the BSD experience. And option three is what we're gonna do in this series is that discover the mythical generator practice. So what, what is this generator practice? If anyone is familiar with uh, our friend Daniel Schmachenberger, he drops his phrase generator function like, like all the time in every, in every one of his talks. Um, I don't think he ever defines it either. And so uh, uh, Daniel and I took a, a stab at, at trying to define it. Um, so initial process that uh, engenders feedback loops, creating larger processes. Um, a, a simple and fundamental rule from which a complex system emerges. So it's basically that kind of like the first thing that, uh, that you drop that just ripples out into a, a larger system. And so we're kind of like taking this generator function idea and uh, calling the, the generator practice. And uh, we defined it as the wisest practice you could start with now that will create a positive feedback loops towards engendering a wisely harmonized ecology and ecologies of practice. So is there one practice that you can start that just ripples out and creates harmony and right relationship with all the other practices? Um, and perhaps an adjacent concept in the self-help literature is a keystone habit, the, the habit that kind of, that anchors you. Um, so yeah, is this, uh, is this generator practice a thing? Like, what is it? Uh, and we've got some assumptions and guesses. Uh, the generator practice may be a myth, but let's pretend it's real. For, the, for the, the purpose of the series. Uh, the first practice you pick, because you'll be picking a practice today, and then uh, if you choose and, and be held accountable to it uh, for the next four weeks, uh, and you can change uh, each week. But the first practice you pick, uh, your first guess, uh, will probably not be the generator practice. Um, the generator practice will be different for each person, and the generator practice will lead to another practice, then another practice, then another practice. And the phrase that we like to use in BSD is the best practice is the one that gets you the next. And the last assumption, I guess, is I sense you already know what the, what this is. Um, Danny, did you, I sense you might want to add something to this. Is there anything you want to jump in with? Yeah, I think um, one way to think about this is, is there something that if you committed to doing, you know that a bunch of other things in your life would just fall into place 
And you, if you just focus on that one thing, the highest priority thing, it just unlocks the rest and trust your instincts on that. Mm -hmm. And one thing I wanted to add too, um, with these three options, uh, besides maybe the third one, the first two involve people, other people. <laughs> so being in a relationship is, is, a, is a practice. Um, okay, so take five minutes now and uh, write down all the practices you are called to do on a daily basis. So something that you can envision yourself doing, uh, one thing that you can be doing from starting tomorrow to next Sunday. Uh, and then once you have them all down, sense uh, um, yeah, all, the, all your call to do and sense what is wise to do. So those are the two uh, kind of aspects there. Then once you have that down, sense into the one that you're most called to do. Uh, and just really just trust your intuition here. You don't, don't, don't engage in like a system two thinking, just kind of pff, trust your intuition. And there's some possible uh, practices that we, uh, um, we listed on the side. So I'll put five minutes on the clock and feel free to write that down. If you have any questions, uh, you can do the raise hand icon or put in the chat. All right, so feel free to take a couple more seconds to finish up the list and kind of sense into one that is uh, the most, that feels the most wise to do, or the one you're most called to do. Uh, and Dana, do you have any kind of thoughts or would you like to share your generator practice? Yeah, um, before I share my practice though, and before we hear from from anyone really i just want to make a quick note on how to think about examples like other people's examples um you already saw a few times peter mentioned trust your intuition uh, i said trust your instincts that kind of thing um, you might have like an instinct for what might be good for you and then you hear somebody else's like super cool practice and then next thing you know you're like oh maybe i should do that pay close attention to that moment you know if you get enamored by somebody else's like really interesting practice trust your intuition about whether or not that's wise. And this kind, kind of comes back to the practice soup thing. It's so easy to outsource these decisions about what we should do to like, I don't know, the latest book or podcaster or like you know, the, the two Stoics. So before I share my example, just that, that's, I kind of wanted to tell everyone that. Um, and yeah, for me, I was thinking about this uh, in the last few days and at first, I thought it might be like uh, exercise because I find whenever I have some sort of like physical intensity in my day, like everything else feels a lot easier. And that's usually what I'd go to. I'd go to like physical training every day. But this week, I felt um, more called to do what I'm calling uh, my daemon appointment. So basically, first thing in the morning, I want to show up for two hours to meet with the daemon or the muse, the, that source of creative vital inspiration that we all potentially have access to. And the idea is if I am disciplined in showing up to that appointment, some of the time the daemon or the muse will also visit me. And uh, to me, the, the way this appointment looks is first thing in the morning, just writing for two hours. Writing is kind of the way I get into it. And writing is a bit different from journaling. Journaling is a little bit more about myself writing is about like discovering some frontier. So that's what I'm going to commit to for the next week. And for myself, mine's going to be quite simple. I just want to wake up at 6 a.m. for uh, for the week. Uh, I feel like that's going to like have a, a positive cascading effect because um, in the summer, you know, like the, um, being more social, going to the family cottage more, drinking more, uh, it's going to disrupt it. I want to need to get back uh, some rhythm and waking up early at the same time uh, does that for me often. So what we're going to do now, actually, you know what, let's uh, um, feel free to pop in the chat uh, if you're called, uh, what maybe one or two or three of your practices are, uh, maybe just the one that you uh, feel most called to uh, commit to for the week if you're going to uh, engage in this accountability system exercise with us. So just pop that in the chat and we can uh, have a collective read and seeing one might, might change your mind or um, might invoke some ideas. You know, when in doubt, we, we recommend being really specific. Um, it's like, a, I'm sure people are familiar with like the smart, smart goal framework where you have like specific, measurable, attainable, timely. Uh, there's also like a smart practice um, 
So, you know, if it's e those are they're either like time bounded or criteria bounded. Um, so it's something that you can kind of fit in your schedule. So meditating 15 minutes um, before 12 is better than just saying meditating or like being mindful uh, throughout the day. Um, <clears throat> That being said, like having sort of a more nebulous intention could work, so experiment with it. But on the spectrum of like more nebulous or more uh, specific, we recommend the, the specific practice. And uh, a heuristic for this is if you were to assign this practice to somebody other than you, would they be able to know when they did it? Like, would they be able to check off, I did it? You know, woke up at six, yes. Showed up for two hours to the Damon appointment, yes. Um, some of these like, more vague intentions, it's very hard to, to delineate when it's done. Yeah, and so it's like you want to have the sense of accomplishment of success uh, when you did it. Um, so here is how we're going to be kept accountable. The, uh, what I'm calling the spreadsheet. This is the spreadsheet we're going to be using uh, throughout the week. Uh, can you see that, Daniel? The yeah, I think you have to give uh, edit permissions. Uh, uh, yeah. Just change that to uh, editor. All right, so you should be able to have access to it now. And yeah, find uh, week by week. <clears throat> this is, we're going to add new tabs. Um, so this is week one. And pick one, practice. Find some real estate. Daniel just added his name. Uh, and put the practice down. And then you can put notes on this section right here. And basically, like if I wake up at uh, 6 a.m., I'm just gonna click, you know, uh, these during the day. And we'll it's be kind of cool because I'm gonna post this on the so Substack too. So people who couldn't make it live uh, can add it as well. So it's gonna be kind of wild. So we'll see the whole Stoa village. What are they practicing? And um, and are they doing it? And it's okay if you don't do it, because maybe this is not the, the right practice for you. But give it a good try, you know, like give, give it a good effort, uh, see if it, um, how it uh, resonates uh, with you throughout the week. And then next week, if you want to do a different practice, you can try a different practice, or you can modify. So the best practice is the one that gets you the next. Uh, and so we're here to experiment. And then next week, we're gonna, if you'd like to show up again, we're going to have, um, you know, conversations and connections about, uh, you know, how the practice went and how your week went and stuff like that. So let's take a moment and populate this. <clears throat> so keep uh, adding um, your practice intention and maybe have any notes. I'll just riff on a few things that are coming up for me. Um, if you see in my notes section, I've added some sort of an extra accountability. And this is something that uh, we do in the um, program as well uh, with the people who sign up in the cohort. But here's an idea if you want to have an extra form of uh, accountability. Uh, message someone that you know, a friend, uh, a friend of virtue, and say, hey, I'm doing this weird thing at this weird place called the Stoa, and uh, uh, I, I want you to help hold me accountable, lovingly accountable to something. So. Uh, for example, I'm going to wake up at 6 a.m. I'm going to message uh, my buddy, uh, Christoph. And Christoph is like, this is crazy. This is my, we had a lot of adventures together. And he's just so thumos. Yeah, so much thumos in, in this guy. Uh, so I'm just going to text him every morning. Uh, 6 a.m., I'm going to say up every morning on the text. And I'm going to send him like a sleepy, extemporaneous message of thumos. Like, bro, we're just going to get it today. We're going to crush it. And that, that's it for, for seven days. And he, he, he'll welcome that. Uh, he'll welcome that. And then he might do it to, to me too. And so that's just kind of uh, set the day off with some fun, good energy. Um, so yeah, could you do something equivalent if, if it's going to the gym for you? Uh, maybe you could mess with someone a gym photo um, while all sweaty. Or maybe if you're doing a meditative practice, maybe you could uh, mess with someone uh, an insight uh, that happened during it. So find someone who's accept, uh, like um, would be agreeable to this. And, um, and yeah, that's, that's, one, that's one way. Uh, and there's, there's one thing, and then we'll get to kind of questions and shares before we close, but uh, there's another thing that I wanted to uh, mention as well. Uh, yeah, okay, yeah, this. It's like, I actually don't like the word practice. You know, I don't like the word discipline either. Like, uh, I, I just, uh, every time I hear, hear the word practice, I, I remember that 
Elvin uh, I- or Iverson, I forget the basketball player's name, uh, where he's like, practice, man, we're talking about practice. I want to play the game. Like, because he's like, he didn't go to practice and stuff. So he got criticized for it. Um, and yeah, like uh, practice has always been associated with like something boring that I have to do, force, discipline, like has that shame thing. Um, so there's an invitation to uh, reframe uh, practice as a game you know, like to use kind of like a a James Carr's definition, like perhaps the practice is just an infinite, a finite game that you play that shapes your capacity to play other finite games and the infinite game of life. Um, So reframing it as a game that you're going into every day, you're playing this little game uh, that you want to get better at and improve at uh, might be a good uh, reframe shift. Um, So that being said, uh, we're going to formally close uh uh maybe like 10 minutes or so and but i want to get some questions and some shares in so if you have any questions or shares just raise your hand or or pop something in the chat and i believe daniel you had your uh, hand up earlier you're you're on mute if you're if you're yeah. there we go uh thank you uh thank you peter thank you daniel i was wondering how you felt about um something that i picked up from gretchen rubin uh, who's giving advice on, on how to change habits and so on, where if you set yourself a bar, like I'm going to do this every day of the week, you're almost setting yourself up to fail uh, because there's going to be something that's going to happen that's going to derail you. And, and she suggests that you plan in, you, you plan to fail. So, for example, in the spreadsheet, I gave myself permission uh, to not make my midnight sleeping deadline uh, to miss it by an hour two two times. I may not do it, but it may happen. And that way, the week isn't, the objective isn't lost to the second I go to bed at 10 minutes after midnight. I don't know if that works against what you're trying to do here, or would that be synergistic with what you're doing? Um, I think you want to share first, Daniel? Yeah, I, I think the short answer is it is synergistic. Um, and what you're kind of describing there, Daniel, is is a form of wisdom, right? If you know that that's just not going to be, it's the if you know that the first formulation of it is too rigid and you're going to fail, um, then that's not a really wise way to design the practice. But here's another way to think about it. I'm personally happy to do something very rigid for a shorter period of time. So if I'm going to do seven weeks where, like, if I'm a minute past, you know, my bedtime, that's considered a failure or seven days, sorry, if I, if I do that, that's an easier thing for me to get behind. Um, and so that's one of the variables you can play with as well. You can keep the practice very rigid, but then shorten the time, or you can give yourself a buffer day. Um, generally speaking, though, the more nuance you add, the more contingencies you add, the harder it is to remember and the harder it is to know when you've succeeded or failed. So that's another thing that you have to trade off against. Two things I'll add is... Um use this uh, technique called the credence level. So your belief in percentage. Uh, so you can do this as an option in the notes section. So feel into that, the practice that you chose and what is your belief that you will get uh, every day you'll do it um, and put a percentage down. Uh, if it's something easy, like, you know, floss one tooth, which is what BJ Fogg recommends them tiny habits to get like a flossing habit in. Yeah, I think that's like pretty hundred percent. And you just got floss one tooth and then and you're done. Uh, and maybe you'll, you'll stay there to floss the others. Um, but if something's uh, more difficult, like 30 minutes working out, um, and then you haven't worked out in a couple months, um, you might have a lot of resistance to that. So that might like hover around, you know, 60 to 70%. Um, and so it's good to feedback, like kind of like what your initial sense is, and then what actually happens. Um, and Sebastian Marshall, who came to the store, and he, he's the guy that created ultra ultra working, he always aims for 70% success in uh, everything he does. Um, and he feels like that's a good number. And so, you know, uh, try to do a hundred, uh, obviously that that's what we're here for. Uh, give it a good college try. And that week by, f- and that kind of that, that thing that just Daniel said, like just knowing you're doing it for a week and then you can just say, let it go. Right. That kind of uh, helps with the, um, getting the hundred percent uh, down. Uh, but yeah, if you get 70, if you get 60, great. That's just feedback. No failure, only feedback here. Thank you. And uh, yeah, so if any like 
questions or just shares anything that came up for you um listening to any of this like maybe some of the framing uh tickled you or you have any um uh, doubt energy emerging just feel free to bring it into the space um we're going to be here for uh, four weeks together yeah, i was sort of uh wondering about the uh this thing that occurs for me sometimes where i create a practice um and uh then in this inquiry practice with the glue like, like i think that's really important i'll discover that the motivation or ethos of this new practice that I'm introducing has like uh, one of the many motivations behind it, or let's say there's like five motivations behind it, like three of them are sort of like defense mechanisms or coping mechanisms. Um, so just as an example, like if I'm working out and there's a few motivations to like relax my heart rate throughout the week and, you know, feel connected with my body, those are some motivations that are like personal or self-regulatory. And then I might be motivated subtly by like shame, looking in the mirror when I'm naked or comparing myself to the other, you know, jacked dudes on the beach, um, feeling some kind of fear about my girlfriend, like not finding me attractive in you know, all of these, these other pieces. Um, and I guess, so that's my example. Maybe there's better examples. Um, but what is like the BSD um, take or philosophy on like motivations behind practices? And like they probably evolve over time. Um, I guess if that makes sense, like like parts that are yeah defense mechanisms. I'm not sure if that lands, but. <laughs> I have some thoughts on this, um, and Peter, I'm curious what yours are. Um, the first is my general bias is uh, action first. So maybe your motivations aren't perfectly great, but that's also its own kind of cope trap where you sit down and try to analyze, like, am I doing this from the right place? Which is important, by the way. It's very important that things come from a good place. But Generally speaking, I think more people are at risk of not moving, not actually doing things in the world than they are of doing things for the wrong reasons. That's generally what I see. So when in doubt, I I'll tilt towards, okay, fine. Like maybe I'm insecure about my physique and that's why I want to go to the gym. Great. I'm going to use that. Um, and then what you'll find is if the best practice is the one that gets you to the next, you start getting data and experience by actually doing the practice. And if you incorporate some form of inquiry with that, ideally with someone like journaling helps, but ideally you have someone who can, you can spar with, then over time, you can kind of unearth like the deeper reasons for what you're doing and then get realigned. So that's one point. And then the other is um, in BSD, one of the things we do is, uh, or we, we've done in the past is uh, we get clear on what our higher self motivations are and what our lower self motivations are, and then we own them. So I have a higher self motivation to go to the gym because um, I, I like, uh, I think it's important to be at a physical frontier on a regular basis. And it feels like a spiritual practice in a way when I'm pushing myself, but I also have the motivation to look good naked. Like I have that motivation. It just happens to be the case that this body mind feels motivated by that. And so I'll write both and I'll, I'll make some kind of like light value judgment so that I'm still conscious of where it's all coming from. But I'm not dismissing that either. You know, there isn't like this meta shame about having like shameful drives for things. So that's my take. Yeah. Um, and we have this uh, like kind of living manifesto document uh, for the BSD program. And uh, for each practice, there's like a higher self motivation and lower self. So like working out, you know, like it could be feeling uh, vitality so you can have a long, healthy life uh, uh, of love. Uh, and lower self is just look, look fucking good naked. <laughs> you know, it's like, um, as long as it's pointing to the same thing, like we're not really motivational reductionists here. Um, and I was quite inspired by this ultra runner uh, guy. And he talks about like, he has like 20 different motivations to get him through the race. You know, so sometimes it's like more status oriented. Sometimes it's more like spiritual to push himself. Sometimes it's just like, I just want to go into a nice warm shower and take a bed and go to the bath. Sometimes it's financial. And so he like oscillates and pivots between the motivations. Um, so experiment, 
you know, this is about experimentation. There's not having like a perfect kind of theory framework and all your motivations are set. They're not going to be. Um, but it's like we're learning through do the doing. Does, does that help, Campbell? Uh, yeah, I think that what I'm, what I'm especially hearing, because sort of any example, like that's personal, you know, like look good naked for one person could be like a, an example or a motivation they relate to in a negative way. Or, you know, like I didn't mean to pick that as one thing, you know, to be bad for or lower self for everyone. But, but what I'm hearing sort of is like the, the reflection as you go, that's sort of like a critical piece, like picking it, anything and then somehow like what's the what's that method for reflecting with others that keeps you kind of readjusting and then I guess that's ultimately what would lead you to the next you know mythic generative practice you know so you kind of dance with it so and this is why I'm sort of biased towards like journaling which is a practice that's pretty much ingrained for me uh, at this point in my life because um, it allows for that constant reflection and when something feels off like, oh, why am I even doing this anymore? This kind of a meditative technique and then I can journal about it. Um, and this is why I really uh, believe in the cultivation of friends of virtue um, because sometimes a journal entry is not enough. I need to talk to a friend like Daniel, like Daniel, like that. I'm a real, like, you know, tight existential knot about this issue. And even though Daniel might not have the perfect advice, but just for him ho lovingly holding space and just throwing some perspective, it just like loosens the knot. Um, so this is why I'm... I'm bias towards inquiry of some form. So any, uh, any, any kind of closing shares, uh, um, thoughts that anyone has? Uh, Krista, did you have a, have a hand up or? Not a hand up, but I just want to say that this, um, yeah, BSC experience is phenomenal of um, experience in the past, even in this setup, like the collective power of going through let's say practices is empowering. So one of the things I've been struggling with is being consistent with movement and just like hearing you all speak and ideate in this energy kind of gives me a little boost, let's say, for the new week. So I just want to say thank you. Yeah, and just having kind of like, maybe, maybe um, you know, I'll do some kind of ad hoc exercise to close this off. But Danny, do you have any, any, uh, anything you'd like to end off with? Um, there was just a question in the chat that uh, people are interested in. In what ways is, a, is the meta crisis a generative force for gathering my EOP? This is a big topic. Um, and actually, in one of the previous iterations of BSD, we had Jordan Hall come in to talk about it. And I'm just going to share the link in the chat. The meta crisis as a forcing function for sovereignty. So it's on the Stoa channel. Um, I'm pretty sure there's something in there that relates to this question. Yeah, like I just love. Uh, like I think metacrisis is really high, high leverage framing um, because it fills the body with uh, a sufficient amount of urgency to say the least. Uh, and then um, it's coupled with not knowing what the fuck to do because it's just, it's just so deliciously complex. Not one person can grok it. And so what do you do there? Um, my answer has been returning, turning to philosophy and wisdom. Um, yeah, so and just, just to give like a quick TLDR on my take on this. Um, so the meta crisis is huge and like overwhelming and, and makes you like afraid and all this, but, um, usually the best path is something very personal and mundane and improving your day-to-day -day sovereignty is actually the best thing you can do to deal with that huge overwhelming thing. And that, and sometimes we forget that. So, um, yeah, improving your integrity, being able to like show up on time for things, having a good relationship between your words and your actions. All of those, they seem basic, but they are the nuts and bolts of solving anything. So yeah, I think that's what you'll, you'll see more of that in that presentation. All right, so um, if you'd like to uh, sign up for updates on BSD, uh, you can do that there, um, keeping it separate from the Stoa Substack. Um, there'll be light marketing, uh, but I'm also doing these dispatches to Thumos uh, daily, uh, just to kind of like pump myself up. So that's one of the practices I'm doing. And, and yeah, maybe we can close off just, uh, just feeling into the, the field, the, the collective field that's, that's emerged here. Uh, and just like, we all have a, like light intention, um, to do one thing, just one thing. Um, it's difficult doing like, you know, when people start 
uh, try to change their EOP, their quality of practice. They just do like 10 things and they get overwhelmed and burned out. And it could work if you have like a boot camp type setting, but just doing it on your own is difficult. Um, you just do one thing, right? And feel into that intention of doing one thing, your own intention, and then feel into the intention of this field right now. Um, and not all of us might do the, do the practices, but um, there's something there with um, being inspired and motivated by people uh, being oriented towards the good, true, and beautiful and uh, cultivating a wiser life. And once you have a uh, sufficient enough sense of that, put one word in the chat uh, to close out today, anything you're leaving with, and then we'll collect those and uh, we'll end today's session. <laughs>